Good morning or good afternoon, depending on which side of the country you're on. Thank you for joining us today. Um, really excited to have you here. Uh, myself and Craig Cecilia, we're, we're both really excited to talk quite a bit today about uh, profitability, gaining profitability momentum, leveraging alternative portfolios. Uh, so this is going to be an exciting webinar today. We're going to go through um, relatively new activity for credit unions that's been growing in popularity. And uh, this continues our 2022 webinar schedule here now into to February, which is wonderful. All right. So today, uh, as usual, um, feel free to submit any questions you have. If you move your mouse around, you'll see a bar pop open and uh, you can go to the Q&A tab and uh, put your question in there. We will answer them along the way or at the end, depending on uh, where it is in the time and how it fits into the conversation. As usual, today's webinar will be recorded. If you or your team would like a copy of it, please reach out to your advisor or to our YouTube channel and uh, you'll be able to see that and all of our historical webinars there also. So uh, again, really, really great set of data out there now. Uh, again, I'm Charlie McQueen, President and CEO of McQueen Financial Advisors. Uh, along with me is Craig Cecilia, uh, Craig's Managing Director and Chief Investment Officer. And uh, Craig heads up all of our investment advisory activities um, in a, a wonderful area of the company. And, and he's also our head economist, we're going to call him today. That's always a great term. Um, along with that, we do have our asset liability management team and our valuation team. And uh, really excited to work with a whole bunch of extremely talented individuals. So uh, thank you, Craig, for joining me. You bet. Thank you for having me, and uh, thank you for everybody that's joined the webinar today. We really looking for, we're looking forward to a great great session. Yeah, it's going to be a ton of fun. Yeah. Well, our, our conversation today is going to have a, go through an economic update, uh, and then we're going to talk about employee benefit pre-funding accounts, charitable donation accounts, some success stories, some returns, a little bit of risk analysis also is going to be in there, probably a little bit of humor, and uh, so we'll, we'll get all that in there, then a, a little question and answer time. So we're actually very cognizant of everyone's time and video calls these days. So we'll keep this right on schedule for everyone. So with that, to kick stuff off, um, I have to give you my level of entertainment in child movies that I watch on a regular basis. And uh, we're starting off is today is the best day ever, uh, which is a quote from the movie Home, the Boove, and it was moving day. They were super excited to move into their new home. And I had a call the other day with a, a client who was really upset and said, gosh, this has been terrible. This economy has been terrible for the past two years. Margins have been terrible. What do I do? I'm maybe thinking about merging. And my response is today is the best day ever. You know, I may have just watched the movie with my daughter the night before, uh, but it's the best day ever because rising interest rates. Uh, we are beginning to see rising interest rates. We've got the Fed predicting rate increases. And what is that going to do? That's going to increase our margin. Uh, most of our earnings, 80, 90% of our earnings come from the margin. So we are going to see margins start to come up. So super excited about that. Now, Craig, you, you have predicted interest rates coming up a little bit here. Um, this chart looks uh, historically pretty flat line, then steep, then flat line. And then we've got some of these projections here. What, what do you see the Fed doing this next, uh, well, this year in 2022? Well, certainly it's a great question and uh, I appreciate you asking. And it's, the funny thing is, is in the, in the whole world, everybody, if you're not an economist, they want to be, you know, the arm check, arm, armchair quarterback or armchair economist is what we all are. And what's interesting is, is that the Fed has a lot of data points leading them to the fountain of raising. Right. And uh, I always kind of think about it that way. The big question is, is how many times will they be raising interest rates? Will it be one? Will it be seven? Will it be at 10? There's some people out there saying it's going to be eight or 10 raises. Now, we're not in that book right now in camp. And as we go through some of the economic things, but we, we do feel that there'll be some raise. We, get, we know the direction of what's going to happen, but we don't really necessarily know how fragile uh, the economy is and how fragile the markets are for different sectors and the impact of raising interest rates. Uh, we do have the Fed that's going to be raising some interest rates uh, starting on March 16. That's the next Fed meeting. Uh, then there's another seven meetings throughout the year. And there's right now the forward curves showing, as you can see in the bottom of this chart, uh, implied rate, bottom right-hand right number, 150. 
for the effective Fed funds rate by February 23. So that means there's going to be four, you know, five rate hikes between now and then. It's just a matter of when they're going to happen according to the futures. I think that's a little heavy on uh, rate moves because there's going to be a lot of things that change. And uh, so we're thinking somewhere in that three camp, four if, you know, people get their way. But we're going to see some definite changes going on as we're going to talk with some of the uh, other data points. So are they going to raise uh, Fed funds rate 50 basis points in March or just 25? How's I think that it's, for a setup? I love it. <laughs> I love it. It's a great segue, right? Uh, I'm a firm believer right now it's only going to be 25 basis points. With all the other programs going on, I mean, the Fed is still actually injecting liquidity into the marketplace as we speak right now. I think I just saw them, uh, you know, some money go right by right now. Uh, they are injecting money. And, uh, you know, we're talking about raising basis points, 50 basis points, while still putting liquidity in the system. There's too many things going on to do at 50 right at the moment. We haven't had much of a taper tantrum. I expected that would take place, but uh, they are still buying stuff, which would be interesting to be buying stuff for monetary easing and raising rates and tightening. Um, it really works well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think the effects of the intent of the Fed and having their hawkish stands and hawkish meaning that they're expected to raise interest rate and tighten up uh, uh, policies, you'll see on the next page and where they really impact. So, well, this page. Thank you, Charlie. Well done. No problem. And uh, I love this curve because it really is telling of not only the current economic times, but also what the treasury market is expecting to happen in the future. And as you see the curve from the beginning of 13 and to 12, that black dotted line, we had a very similar curve like that not too long ago. And now we have the red bellied curve. Like, what was your analogy the other day when um, you were watching a movie laying down or something? No, it was me laying on a lounge chair. It looks like me there, the belly curve that comes up and flattens out at the top. So I got it. Yes, yep. absolutely. A non-expectant Charlie. Yep. Um, <laughs> it's funny though, but you look at it and I love the analogy because the belly of the curve is that mid range, you know, that two to five year and look how much it's actually changed compared to the short end and the long end it really has moved the most and that change 100 basis points plus in that belly and which is fantastic by the way for us for for right. the credit unions for the banks for everybody because it's helping margins because that's where we're going to be booking assets and that's one of our strategies for profitability is to make sure we stay on a good strategy. But uh, right. yeah, I love that belly, how it's well, really increased in value. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And, and uh, uh, if you look at the short end of the curve, meaning with one month, two month, three month time frame, there's not a lot of increase or cost of funds shouldn't move much. Yield on loans and investments in the two, three, four year range should definitely be coming up quite a bit. And then on the far side there, the long term inflation tenure hasn't gone real far. And that's part of uh, your comments about uh, rates not going up super high because the market's right now betting that inflation won't be a problem long term. And, and that's really different than what you hear on TV. Right. All right. Excellent. Well said. Transitory. We got to define that at some point in time this year. Right. Yep. And I think we will. <laughs> yep. Stuff that goes away. That was simple. All right. So as we look at the long term picture, the red line, the Fed funds rate, the blue line, the two year treasury, and the black line, the 10 year treasury. What you can see here is the ski jump inverted has happened, or the hockey stick of others put it. The two-year treasury definitely has come up substantially. The 10-year treasury has come up a bit, but a much more of a, a normal process. If you look back at different times, you know this does in, indicate the Fed will be raising rates as the two-year treasury ties in tight with Fed funds and, and has a tendency to follow. So we're, we're definitely seeing that take place. And, uh, and an interesting question is how high can rates go? Because you know, what happens if mortgage rates hit 5%? Does that, does that make everyone freak out that's never had a higher than a 4% mortgage their entire lives? Right. It's a good question. We've really seen the writing is on the wall of the effects of the slightly higher interest rates, you know, with the 15 years and 30 years up, just minimally how refi market is just basically it's it's existent but it's 
essentially compared to where we were on volumes, it is non-existent, quite frankly. Uh, but it, we have seen in the last several decades that higher interest rates does not mean core lending is gone and mortgage market's dead. We've got a great structure of housing supply issues that's helping the market stay there and people are going to continue to move around. Yeah, we're, we're going to see. We're going to cover a couple of slides on housing, which is going to be really interesting because people are still going to move. And we talk about the three Ds there, and uh, we'll we'll go through that in a, another page here, which is fun. Um, inflation is obviously a concern. Uh, you turn on the, the news; inflation is all they talk about. And to to remind everyone how you get inflation is you apply lots of cash. And that top little graph is the M two money supply. It does the hockey stick up. Uh, which is all of the programs, the $5 billion plus of programs, almost $6 billion of the programs that put cash into everyone's pockets. So you do that, then you mess up the supply chain. Uh, you get the Canadian truckers blocking things as we have here in uh, Michigan and, and Ontario right now, which is interesting. Uh, but you get this, this supply chain problem and, and inflation hits pretty hard. Um, you know, you see this, and one of the things we talked about a moment ago is that this is more transitory than not, and you expect this to reverse course relatively soon. Is that correct? Yep, I do. We had a big change in 2021 with respect to unemployment and some other moratoriums that are kind of moving away. But what it, really what I love to look at when I look at this chart, especially the Fred chart of money supply, is what happened to the money that we were putting into the economy. And were we savers or were we spenders? And, uh, you know, it was a combination of the two, quite frankly. You can see how all of our balance sheets ballooned, and, uh, regardless of what part of the country we're in. Uh, but people have since since the spigots have been come off the spending hasn't necessarily come down as much right so i don't think that we're going to continue to be able to support that kind of demand going into the uh, full 2020 yeah we're actually it's interesting when you look at what the 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 uh where we're seeing inflation used cars new cars has been a huge component actually last month they both came down uh, and and the, the Charlie economic index is extremely complex. I drive by a, a GM car dealership and about four other car dealerships every day coming and going from work. And up until about three weeks ago, there were zero cars in the parking lot. Now there's about 50 in the General Motors dealer parking lot. And so we are seeing that supply chain get fixed. One of the other big things is furniture. And why has furniture gone up so much? Well, the, the, the shipping costs have skyrocketed. And so it'd be interesting once we figure out some of these shipping problems, logistical problems, and, and auto manufacturers get chips, actually, that, that would really help, um, help these prices be a lot better off. I just can't wait to see that publication of the Charlie Economic Index. This is going to be cool to watch and see. Remember, the last one was how many help wanted signs I saw while driving down the road. That was the other index that we had. That, a few, a few absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But we haven't seen this type of inflation since 82 and um, Volcker, Volcker went then back and crushed it. And we had Billy beer and peanuts and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, but the transportation logistic issues are very different now than then. We did have some oil price issues then. Now we have a lot of self-inflicted oil and gas price wounds and hopefully we'll see those change. Um, but one would think logistics will get back to normal here. Uh, but wage-based inflation is permanent, so we are going to have some level of inflation here that's going to stick around, but not as high as the 7%. Is, is that a fair statement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, slowly but surely coming down. Well, another thing is the labor force, and you mentioned that earlier. You know, we're back to pre-pandemic levels, basically, at this point, if not even lower. Would you agree with that? I do. I, we had uh, employment numbers come out the last week and this week, just depending on what type of data you're looking for. You know, we had really nice non-farm payroll numbers coming up. We had an uh, uh, interesting thing. We also had what we've been preaching for quite a while is, is we can't fix this until the participation rate comes up, which we had a nice tick this past week of coming up. And what's fascinating, absolutely fascinating, is the increase in the unemployment rate. So we ticked up. We went from before we were at four to three, nine. Now we're back to four. Big move. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the thing is, is people are entering into the market again, the workforce again. And that number of people re-entering out, has outpaced the number of people that got employed. So that's why we had the unemployment rate kick, kick up one-tenth of one percent. Yeah, it's, it'd be nice to see schools stay in and, and, and working parents be able to work. That's been a huge issue, especially with uh, women leaving the workforce to take care of kids. 
and love to see the schools stay back in. And then they're doing good. Actually, most of the country is doing good. There's a couple of states that we won't make fun of because we don't like to make fun of Illinois or Chicago that often. But right. now we're a little concerned about some of the school districts here or there. Uh, as I tease that, we love Illinois. We love Chicago. Um, speaking of home sales, we're, we're seeing home sales go at a very brisk pace, very quick. Um, friend was talking that they had someone moving for business to, to Detroit from North Carolina. And there was a two week sales time in the house in Carolina. And there was about a, a two minute sales schedule on the timing of houses selling in Detroit, uh, all real estate's local, but man, there's been some pretty big changes going on here. Uh, home values are up and high. And one of the things, and you'll see, uh, is the supply and demand issue is we, st- it hasn't been fixed. Uh, we've got a lot of people that are looking for houses right now, even with the uptick in, uh, mortgage rates. And so therefore we don't think there's going to be a huge correction to home values. Even if with this economy, you know, flattens to comes back down to the recession word, which would, you know, eventually happen in 23 or four, right. Uh, <laughs> not to predict anything. Um, but we do think there's not not going to be a housing crash like we experienced yeah. during because during the uh, Great Recession because we we have a total different set of reasons that we're in this cycle right now from an economic standpoint. Yeah, millennials here are buying a lot of homes. They've really entered core home buying age. Uh, a lot of people are predicting that there's going to be a big wave of buying for the next ten to twenty years uh, just because of that that big pool of you know the largest generation since going back to the baby boomers. It's truly amazing and. Uh, there's also a lot of people who've been stuck in their homes for a long time, given what's happened with the home values and, and structure. You know, with that, I, we do see some some interesting issues. I mentioned self-inflicted wounds with uh, oil prices and gas prices here on the bottom. Average gas prices that did come down a little bit, but um, you know, we when uh, the, a lot of the current administration uh, had some negative viewpoints on gas and oil, and, and that's come to fruition here. But also, the economy is expanding. When you have a really good expanding economy, demand goes up. And, and so we're definitely seeing that here. So hopefully this uh, starts to come back down and this will slow the economy. When we get really high gas and oil prices, it does slow the economy because it hurts people's disposable income. Um, one of the things here that, um, uh, Craig, uh, I, I don't know, this, this looks kind of ugly at the far right hand side of these charts, but what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I, you say ugly, I say this is opportunity right? <laughs> We've got a lot of people that are really scared right now because this, you know, you mentioned a lot of people stuck at home and people opening up retail brokerage accounts and doing and investing in the markets, but we're all affected through our 401ks and our, some who has pensions, if that's pension funds still a thing nowadays, I don't, you know, I don't know, nope. unless, unless you work for the government. Correct. Um, but it's a great opportunity because regardless of what's going on in our economic cycle and interest rate cycle, it's, there's going to be sector rotations, which I think you had a noted on there. And it, it, it really does play out to where there's going to be opportunities in the marketplace and kind of lightening up on certain industries, Not maybe not all tech. You can see, uh, or I looked back and I looked at a average rate of returns on first rate hikes of different sectors. And there's several of them that perform very very well. And there's some that just are like, whoa, run for the hills. <laughs> well, it's interesting here. You know, it is most sector rotation, but if you remember how far we've come so quickly and a really great run in the stock market here. This goes back to 2012 and the, the, or 2012 in the top chart and, and 2012 in the bottom chart, NASDAQ and the S&P, it's really come up. And as you mentioned, a lot of people at home with lots of new liquidity and they're buying stocks and not only meme stocks, they're buying regular stocks too. So it's, uh, it's definitely going to keep things going out. And we're not locked at home. We're just hanging out at home because we don't want to go to the office. Um, although we're both doing this from the office, it's kind of a unique thing to have us all here. I love it. People around excitement. Um, so 2022 has great profitability growth. And I, I think I'm really excited about 2022. We talk about the margins. Margins are improving. There's going to be better earnings. I think, Craig, you're spot on. Inflation is going to moderate. We're going to see loan volume improve and loan losses will be lower than average. Uh, Why is that? It's hard to, to, it's hard to lose money on a home when it's up 30% or 40% in value and cars up in value. So much asset value has increased and we like appreciation much better than depreciation. And we would rather see things worth more than worth less. So a lot less loan losses I would expect. Um, But timing is going to be interesting. Uh, It's going to take a while for the margin to come through. And and so that's one of the things why we want to talk about uh, EBPA and CDA accounts today. Yep, sounds good. So 
couple things here. Interest rate risk management, absolutely important. Um, especially with rising interest rates, how are you affected? That's going to be something you really want to pay attention to. And then number two, what's this, Greg? Well, um, investment strategies, making sure that people do not necessarily do a wholesale change to their investment strategy that they've been following for the last few years. And the reason being, this is a part of the strategy in a rising rate environment. There's going to be some unrealized losses with rates going up and values coming down, but they're unrealized to just that. And if a lot of uh, historical behavior, when this happens, is to rein in the strategy, hold on to a little bit of liquidity, shorten up asset duration, whether it's lending or investing, and it actually kind of defeats the purpose of having the strategy that's been in place. You need to stay deliberate as long as you're monitoring your risk. Um, Limiting the cash on a balance sheet is a great example right there because uh, rates are up. You remember the belly of the curve, our key part of that curve, two to five year duration and average life. Our rates are up. Let's book a higher earning assets while we have the opportunity so we can help bring our margins up as the environment changes. And you can't try to time the market to be right at the top. So that's why you got to continue on with the strategy. Yeah, it's really smart to keep that strategy in place. Keep cash low. Um, focusing on non-interest income is going to be big. Obviously, we're going to have a rotation of non-interest income from mortgage to other areas. Um, debit and credit card optimization, that's going to be a big thing. As, as we launch a lot of people dropping fees, this is a, a non-seeable fee by the, the consumer member, and uh, that gives them the ability to continue to work with you and to make a little bit of dollars there. Um, I'll tell you, with the advent of secondary capital, it's a huge opportunity to ensure proper capitalization, and that's something that's really big out there. If you're tight on capital, you have big growth plans, looking at secondary capital today is a huge, huge opportunity because the costs are so low. Uh, so that's one other point to look at. And then uh, last but not least, point seven here today is alternative portfolios. And uh, we're going to hop into the alternative portfolio discussion now. So uh, Craig, there's two types of alternative portfolios here. We have employee benefit pre-funding, which referred to as EBPA and charitable donation accounts. I'd love to have you walk us through a couple of slides on, on each of them. And uh, we'll start off with, uh, well, let me talk a little bit about what alternative portfolios are. We can start with that. Sure. That's a great idea. So tr traditionally, we're going to be investing the balance sheet, what we can't lend out, right? So ultimately, we take in our deposits. We're going to try to lend out to our membership or our depositors and as much as we possibly can. But then there's a function of what we can't lend out or another function of liquidity and strategy to have an investment portfolio to help manage the interest rate risk of our balance sheet. And our traditional portfolios have products that are you know, very common to everybody, uh, CDs, treasuries, agencies, municipal bonds, corporate bonds, mortgage-backed securities, and CMOs. Those are kind of the main categories that you would see in a traditional portfolio. Now, the returns have been slowly coming up as we talked about, right? So right now, average new purchases, people that are booking right now are anywhere from call it one and a half to two and three eighths, somewhere in that range. If your average is going to be high ones, close to 2% on average. So we're once again, building them up. What's it fun to think about, though, is the alternative space of, all right, that's good returns, but it's not great. And how can we improve those returns? And this is where there's been that carve out of legislation to say, you can get into some uh, other types of investments that will provide additional earnings to your institution to offset some type of expenses, some of them being charitable to giving, some of it being about benefit expenses for employees. Uh, some of the time we'll talk a lot about the in detail, some risks involved in this, but this, some of the alternative type of investments are corporate bonds. And that's the, one of the biggest questions that people say is, is, well, wait a minute, I can do a corporate bond because I'm a state charter credit union into my regular portfolio. Well, now we're looking at corporate bonds that might not with, fit within the policy from a duration standpoint, interest rate risk standpoint, a credit standpoint, uh, a lot of different ways that we can get into. And then also for federal credit unions, uh, you know, you can buy those bank notes, but you can't necessarily buy corporates at all. So it's kind of we're going into that alternative space. Some preferred stocks, some ETFs, regular stocks as well, or all these types of things that we'll talk about with risk and help to enhance earnings for the institutions 
to offset expenses. And that sounds pretty good to me is offsetting expenses with higher returns. Yeah, it is. It's, and it's a, uh, it's a pretty neat thing. And with that, you know, not a lot of people have um, taken advantage of this in, in the industry right now. We're about 29% of credit unions are using employee benefit plans. And I, I want to stress this. We, we get asked this question all the time. Um, Pro, they're programs for everyone. It doesn't matter the size of your, your, your institution, your credit union. We have uh, actually created 400,000 in assets that has an EVPA account, and, and we have some size 18 billion that have EVPA accounts. So there is a lot of, of opportunity. Anyone can do this. And, and the, the key to that also, and we're going to talk about expenses of healthcare, they're relative to your size of institution. So this is actually something important for everyone to think about. Um, yeah. char- charitable donation accounts are used by even a smaller percentage. And this is one where I just look at the, the world we're in and, and how important it is, is to have a mission and, and do what's right for your mission. And, and focus giving is something I spent a lot of time thinking about. And again, here, there are programs for everyone. We have actually some people as, as small as 12 million doing this and high as 18 billion. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people can do a lot of different things. And I think that it's important to, to realize that people can do this. Anyone can do this. It's not just for super large credit unions. It's, it's, it's for everyone today. So I want to make sure everyone knows that. Now, Craig, there's some limitations. How big of a portfolios can you do here? Oh, this is the fun stuff because this gets into regulation, right? And we all know. Let's do the wave for the regulators. Woohoo! So, <laughs> um, we're looking at uh, written guidance and non-written guidance when we're talking about these limitations and talking about employee benefits. There isn't a written guidance with respect to employee benefits. Uh, so, the rule of thumb, the target allocation maximum would be about 25% of your net worth. Now, when looking at that, what really determines what one person, what institution can do and the other one cannot do is is really a various number of things. One is what state are you located in? Some states look at uh, concentrated asset ratios as well. Others are looking at, well, we'll be more lenient or we have no set guideline, but it has to be prudent for the amount of risk that you're putting on. And that kind of goes down to what your net worth ratio is versus the risk asset, the profile, the risks of the assets that you're booking as well. On the charitable donation side, you know, the charitable giving to 501c3s, that is a written law and it's a 5% of net worth is the max amount that can be invested into a charitable donation account. And once again, uh, we'll go through some of the due diligence and the process and procedures that everybody needs to go through. But ultimately, the regulators are looking for reasonable risk for each institution, which does vary from one to another. And then the other thing is really in the due diligence process is that understanding of risk. And the regulators will be examining all right, you can verbally tell them, but they want it written and see the evidence that they understand it that, uh, from all the way from the board level to management level to your partner in managing the risk on the portfolio that you've created. Yeah, the, the documentation is extremely important with this. And as we flip into employee benefit pre-funding accounts specifically here, um, you know, this is allowing creators to direct a portion of their excess liquidity into really covering this benefit expense. And we get asked this question all the time, what are the expenses? And oh, hey, it's, it's, it's every type of benefit expense. It's health insurance premiums, life insurance costs, retirement, 401k, 457Bs, uh, post-employment plans. You know, one of the things we're hearing a bit about is people talking about you know, with, to, to keep a management team in place. Uh, you'd be able to structure something to put people and keep people in place with a deferred payout. Sometimes in mergers, we see people getting paid dollars, and this is a way to say, hey, let's pay our own people and keep our own institution running. So a lot of neat opportunities here. This is why we say this fits any size institution. Smaller institution is going to have smaller health insurance premiums because the number of employees, it's probably the same dollar premiums, the, the total overall number of the smaller number of people will be smaller, and as you get bigger, it gets bigger. Um, and one of the things that is interesting to us um, and, and, and Craig were talking about this earlier today, you know, an average credit union with about $750 million in assets has $2.8 million on average of employee benefit expenses. And, and this is not getting into retirement, supplemental retirement plans. This is, this is before that. And so the number is going to get bigger. It's going to be easily over $3 million a year when you add in a couple other components. But on average, about 600000 401k and $2.3 million of healthcare expenses. 
uh, which those are probably not going down. Not that I want to bet too much with you, but I bet they're not going down. What do you think? Yeah, I don't think they're going down either, quite frankly. We've got too many things going on that people are living longer, right? So that just, you know, the insurance companies need to uh, make sure that they run their balance sheet as well and income statement correctly. Yeah, and usually we only bet on the Lions. and uh, But this year, the Lions are effectively going to the Super Bowl, right? That's what I hear. That's what I hear. And Matt Stafford and Eminem, and that's, that's all Detroit. So it's well, not quite the Lions, but they're close as they're ever going to get. Um, health healthcare costs are, are skyrocketing, and um, they have been, and they keep going up. Um, and this is in 2019 dollars. You can see what's happened here from 1970 to today. Um, and this is, you know, as we love to have fun in these conversations, I just want everyone to imagine how much our healthcare costs are going to go up next year. Uh, when the government now has mandated that every employee receives two rapid COVID tests a week, which means eight per month. And if you think the average American household has, you know, two and a half people, let's just say everyone's on the high side. Uh, so now we're doing eight tests per person per month. Uh, so 24 tests. And if you can buy a test at CVS for $20, I've got to believe the cost for the government to ship one to my house is going to be closer to $40. Um, you take all that crazy problem math and you really go down to uh, eight times three times 40 uh, is $960 a month. And uh, it, it's all covered by your insurance. Yeah, that's a big number. And that's just, you know, just dealing with testing, right? right. Uh, you know, as we know that there's going to be a lot of variants and a lot of viruses as we get out of this, you know, pandemic and endemic, and it's just going to continue on. Expenses are going up. I was told the pandemic ended the other day. That was a viewpoint by a number of people. I don't know if it's true, but it sounded good. And we just call it over and we just continue on. But yeah, so healthcare costs are going to come up. And, and, uh, but so how an EBPA works is, again, as Craig mentioned earlier, we invest up to 25% of our capital. We did a simple example here. You take $10 million, a round number, everyone can grow or shrink depending on their, their size institution. And just picking another round number, 5% return. Now we're getting much closer to six today. Um, but just if we use five for a round number, uh, $10 million invested equals $500,000 a year of earnings. So it can be a significant boost to earnings to help pay for these expenses. Very helpful there. Yeah. Uh, any other previous slide? Should I go back or are we okay here? Nope. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Thank um, you. No problem. So what do we do with these earnings? Well, you know, I, I look at this as we can make this free and, and this is free money in a lot of ways. Why is that? Well, if we say, hey, let's let's just take half of this $500,000 and apply that towards benefit expenses. And we take the other half and, and say, this is what we would have lost if we invested it or had it in, in loans and investments combined. And so effectively what we're doing is we're increasing our earnings by $250,000. Now we are taking some different risks and we're going to talk about risks and return and quantification of those risks. But we feel it's a you know fairly you know expectable way to be able to make a very good return on this, and then you can apply these additional dollars to help cover those expenses. And this is something as I think about those healthcare expense increases. I mean, it's it's high enough today, but it's going to get worse. It has to get worse based off all the math. Um, this will be a way to help protect yourselves. And in this simple example, protect yourself against another two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in benefit expenses. Now. Um, if you want to help someone retire, what are, what are one of the great ways we could do here? So this is kind of a neat way of thinking about it as well is employee benefits and they come in a lot of different shapes or forms. And what we're kind of looking at is, is it's a very common structure of looking at how do we fund a retirement plan for an executive? And very typical, you'll see three years of retirement income that would be paid out to them. And a pulley benefit account is a fabulous tool to actually help accomplish that, where you can do it and fund it without any real true cost to you uh, by looking at you know the numbers and the returns. Um, a good example is is executive that's making approximately $100,000 a year. We want to give them some insurance benefit coverage as well for those three years of retirement. So it's about $125, or $125,000 a year that we want to give to them. The simple math at a 5% return on a conservative portfolio, we would need to invest, well, approximately $5 million, and that would return about two hundred and fifty. dollars You know, half covers that executive benefit, and the other half can go for prefunding another executive 
executives in advance or you know just basically going down into our income to help offset other meta benefit expenses as well yeah and that that's the math right there i mean if you think about it we you can make the 250 125 you leave in the credit union to replace those earnings so the credit union has not had any negative impact earnings you have another $125,000 to pay for that benefit so really just a, a neat way to be able to provide benefits and not harm the earnings of the institution at all. So it's, it's pretty, I, I get excited about this. Almost the best day ever, but it's, it's pretty darn exciting. It's getting there. It is. Spring is around the corner here. It's uh, what, 40 degrees in Detroit today with beautifully sunny. It makes you want to go outside. Well, flipping to beautiful things and, and, and thinking of a uh, higher level things, charitable donation accounts. And, um, Charitable donation accounts are a great way to help you with your giving and your social mission. It's a way to take money and, and the success liquidity and, and actually, you know, help out people. Um, Craig, there are some limitations in giving. Can you walk through this a little bit here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so these charitable donation accounts just are just, they're my favorite accounts. I, I've heard like you say it, I've Zach Whaley here as I said it. It's just wonderful because it does go along with our mission of giving back to our communities, giving back to uh, 501c3 charities that are impactful to either us, our communities or our employees or members. And that's one of the other things we had a great idea that somebody said, hey, why don't we get our membership involved, you know, and say, hey, we're accepting submittals to support charities. But it really does help establish a good relationship or rapport or membership of them feeling good about, you know, banking with you. Um, when we set these things up, you have to actually have the beneficiary of your contributions needs to be a fully organized 501c3 charity. And I think one of the th bullet points there is cleaning up. And we're, we are, and I know each one of us are inundated with requests. And I, and I do, you know, it, it's hard to say, but there is a lot of need out there. Uh, but it does help you refocus on what you can and cannot give to and allow to to uh, create a good revenue stream to actually fund those contributions. The requirements for the extra earnings that we're making is all the other question that people ask. And it's that top bullet point is, how much of this earnings do I need to give away? Now, for most people in the country, it's 51% of that additional income, kind of income coming out of that CDA that needs to be gifted to a 501c3. You can choose to give away more or all of it, but that would be the minimum threshold of giving away. If you're a state chartered credit union, the majority of you fall within that same criteria. There are a few exceptions to that where some states have a different percentage, some up to 100% on some of the earnings as well. Uh, but the bottom line is, is you can gift more because you're going to be earning more and it might not be a bad idea to really help increase the number of donations that you actually make. And that's one of the reasons I love it. Lastly is that foundation bullet point is uh, not everybody can afford or has a foundation, but there are some out there that exist and actually quite a few of our clients have them established. Uh, the foundation if established correctly, it can be the beneficiary of the risk gifts of those, of those monies. Once it enters into that foundation, then it's up to the foundation to handle things uh, appropriately based on the foundation's outlook. So your foundation that you create can make things a lot easier and then streamlining your process of gifting to other institutions or entities. Yeah, it's really an interesting way to focus on your community and, and be very pointed with your giving. And you know, speaking about that giving is, is what does it take to donate $100,000 to charities today? Well, without a charitable donation account, you take $10 million in assets, you earn 1% on those, which might be a cash or short-term investment today. Um, the $10 million times 1% is 100000 And so you're, you're tying up a lot of assets here. With, if we use a charitable donation account, if you have $2 million in assets earning 5%, uh, it's, that's, that's $100,000. And so it's really exciting thinking about how you can actually, you know, use a smaller number of assets, or you can even use a little bigger. And if you did four million in assets earning five percent, you end up with two hundred thousand dollars. You put fifty-one percent of that you give to to charity, a little over a hundred thousand, and you keep a little less than a hundred thousand, and your earnings don't get impacted at all. So this is a way, actually, if you don't do a, a foundation or don't have a foundation or don't have a very defined charitable activity, 
this is one way to actually start one by putting this together. Um, to me, this is really exciting. It becomes effectively free giving, and it's not often we, we get that opportunity to do that. So pretty, pretty darn exciting. You can even do more, donate all 200,000 if you wanted to and not keep any of it. That's another great option to say, hey, we're, we're giving a lot more today. So pretty exciting activities. Now, Craig, one of the things people ask us on a regular basis are what are the returns and, and how are we doing earnings wise on these and what, what can you expect to get from this kind of activity? Yeah, very common, extremely important to talk about. And as we have our initial conversations with people that are looking, walking down the path of opening one, uh, they, that, that's one of the original things they ask is, well, with the effort of going through this, which the effort is not big, it's very easy. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but what kind of returns? And it's not a black and white answer on what your returns can be. Is the page that Charlie has up there right now is a sample of a portfolio that can be a conservative portfolio. Uh, and if you look at it on the left-hand side, there's some corporate bonds listed. There's some preferred stock section there with A and B, and then there's some common stocks. And what comfort level your com credit union has on risk and appetite for return will dictate what kind of expected returns will be there. And that's where we're, the, through the due diligence process, that's really kind of gone through really at a really high level and then really drill down to very much very detailed to where uh, even the board member is looking at all of the risks and returns and where that would make sense. On the right hand side you can see on a conservative portfolio is a sample of allocations amongst these asset class 30% in corporate bonds, 40% in preferred stocks which is next in a capital structure and then into some common stocks at 10% and the returns to, to second from the right or third from the right column is where our yields are. So a conservative portfolio on a weighted average basis, somewhere around a 4% gross return on that portfolio. So without having a lot of volatility to your income statement from marketing to market, but having decent kind of return over a standard portfolio for a conservative, conservative makeup, we think is very reasonable. For this institution, their annual income was about 600,000. The additional income, I'm sorry, 3.8 million, the additional 600,000 brings up the 4.4. So it was an increase, just over 15, 16% of income actually for doing a conservative portfolio. Yeah, it's a big increase. And one of the things that's interesting, a lot of people talk today about the effect to uh, income statement and just to point out here, corporate bonds and um, regular preferred stocks maturity dates, you know, they don't they don't have an effect through the income statement. Now we have to look carefully. We do see the perpetual uh, preferreds and the commons, and so waiting here can really modify anyone's risk or concern of price changes. And so there's a lot of techniques we have that we can do to help you protect yourself from price changes. All right. now, Craig, here's a little bit more of a balanced portfolio. So effectively here, this is just a, a bit more risk by playing with those allocations. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Through the due diligence process, they're uh, willing to accept a little bit more volatility of the, va the valuation of the portfolio. And ultimately the risk reward was that instead of having a 4% return, it's a five and a half percent anticipated return, increasing their overall income by about 21%. Okay. And it's neat here to see the gross yield here is 5.5% in this example portfolio. No guarantee of returns here, but just looking through and giving some examples of, of what we've what we've accomplished and uh, people have done. So nice, nice increase. Now here getting aggressive, this is a bit more of a, wow, a bunch of zeros here I see. And then a hundred percent. Yep. Heavy minor. into the stock market. Exactly. Uh, returns. Now, stock market, if you've been in the market for the last couple of years, you're, you got double digits return. I think our conservative approach is an eight and a half percent return estimate, which is for the stock market, increasing overall income for this institution of about 33 okay. percent. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. You have two components. You have dividends and valuation change. And so those are always things to take into account and make sure we're, we're comfortable with that structure. So speaking of comfortable structure, uh, risk becomes an important conversation. And we have a few slides here on risk of a, a balanced portfolio they've put together. Give us some insight to the slide, Craig. Right. When walking down the path of uh, 
doing either an employee benefit account or a charitable donation account. It's making sure that everybody understands the risks involved. And one of those areas is the uh, marking to market value. And so one of the processes that an institution must go through, it's not a suggestion, it's a must go through, is look at, all right, what are, where is our amount we can invest in? And then what is our various asset mixes that we just kind of went through, whether it's marking to market volatile stocks or just some non-perpetual preferreds or corporate bonds. And you kind of want to have to look at is what, what is your adjust, capital adjustments on the securities or asset classes that are required to be marked to market. And so I'm, this is a good example of how it happens for this institution, starting out with an adjusted capital base of $73 million. And then if there's a pullback to the uh, stock market, it adjusts down the value of uh 33 basis points where your adjusted net worth drops to 1238 from a 1242. And then your portfolio value, what it drove that was about a $430,000 devaluation of your actual portfolio that it would have to flow through that income statement, a change and drop of the portfolio value of about 4%. And then you got to go through a worst case scenario. It's almost like a shock testing and worst right. case scenario and running ALM reports, right? Yep, and so you gotta, yeah. So the custom report, we actually do a report where we devalue the equity market and we also raise interest rates 350 basis points. So you not only have a devaluation on the unrealized losses, but you also have the devaluation of the market to markets as well. Ultimately with those, with those drops, you're looking at a net worth drop of 148 and uh, 21% on the overall portfolio. And, and looking at this, though, this, this shows this from there, you can not only look at from just an overall portfolio value, here you're looking at more of a product modification of risk, correct? Yeah, well done. And how the risk goes from left to right. Cash, obviously not a lot of risk for cash. It doesn't really change in value based on interest rates. It changes in value based on inflation. But we're, not, you know, we're not factoring in inflation. But you go from corporate bonds to preferred stocks to common stocks, that typical capital structure of a corporation and how they would be affected in a market adjustment. Once again, a due diligence that one should go through when assessing what their risk tolerances are and what would be appropriate based on net worth and risk appetite and complexity of balance sheets. Yeah, it's really important to understand your risk parameters. And it's also important not to just say, hey, we can't do that. It's too risky because there's definitely decisions that can be made to structure uh, risk that makes sense. And, and I, I talked a little bit earlier about fair value briefly, just made a, maybe a little bit of a foreshadowing comment here. And um, you know, this is something that's really important. Some securities get marked to market through fair value and some don't. Right. Yeah. So it really nicely laid out here. Great example, Charlie. Uh, and you can see that there is uh, some dollar amounts that are changing for each of these. But if you look at the, the pullback and this and this is the impact, I don't know which 17 uh, percent. So it's the aggressive portfolio. And you can see that the changes in the fair value versus a non-fair value kind of increase as you go down the riskiness of these portfolios portfolios, or I should say the change in the stock market, the severity of the devaluation, excuse me. Uh, but you can see that, you know, some is non value, some is fair value, and this can be adjusted, customized to any person's risk tolerances. We've had companies that are customers that said, I don't want any fair value in that uh, uh, adjustment. Does that mean it's not an eligible or not a good product for us? And the answer there is no. You can be customized into asset classes, have no fair value adjustment, but still, you know, double or triple your expected returns based on where current market rates are. And one of the things that's really important here is you're not buying a mutual fund. We're not coming here. You're not, we're not a mutual fund where it's, you're going to have value change across the board, just like everyone else. These are custom portfolios, custom structure to fit your needs. And that's really important to remember here. And uh, that's something that is you know, very unique with us that we're given this custom portfolio to fit the risk parameters you have and that you and your organization are, pretty, are comfortable with. So really, really important. And, and speaking of that, um, we've got a couple real-world examples here, and uh, you know, I know, kind of fun. Uh, <laughs> and uh, 
you know, one of them here, uh, we love this patty, um, ran into me in an airport and, uh, yelled at me and said, why didn't you do this sooner? And uh, I laughed and said, what are you talking about? Uh, but in the end, it came down to that. They, they wish they would have done it sooner. You know, they're, they're, this institution is making $400,000 more a year right now by having an EBP account. And uh, just it's a huge dollar amount. And that's really helping them uh, do all sorts of things, including client retention. Um, but just just a neat thing to see that. And, um, and speaking of client retention, we had a, another client tell us, uh, the other day that, um, you know, they've actually been able to retain 90% of their employees, which is, is one would think is normal in a lot of environments, but today it's a very difficult thing as we, uh, as numbers of, you know, if you read the paper, 40% of people are thinking of making changes, um, but huge numbers out there, but, uh, you know, they've retained 98% of their employees and they've been using the EBP account to, to help them and to help retain employees, to help pay for benefit expenses, a lot of different things. So, and this is also, it's, this is a smaller portfolio. It's a, a $2 million portfolio, uh, which is a wonderful portfolio. And it's enabled them to, to really help take care of their, their, member, their, their coworkers, excuse me. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Great examples. And everybody's story is slightly different. There's some that's commonality where they're just offsetting of the benefit expenses, but then there is like uh, the retention is just a wonderful thing for employee benefits. And as we already talked, just a charitable giving is just the other side of the equation where we can just give more and benefit ourselves as well. It's a win-win situation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thinking of this, a uh, couple closing comments here before we wrap stuff up as we're getting close to the end of our time. Um, you know, one of the things that's important is, is doing this in a process and understanding who needs to do what. And, um, you know, Craig, when, when you start kicking off a, the EVPA and CDA process from so, with a, a credit union, what, what happens here? What are the, the steps? Well, everybody, it, and Charlie, I love, you know, when you ask somebody, is it an easy process to go through? And in, in reality, it's easy. I, mean, I always like to say it's mostly easy. <laughs> <laughs> It's not painstaking, but there is definitely the certain processes that need to be followed. It starts off with the uh, policy creation and update. And in creating a, a policy that is right and captures the intent and strategy of the credit union and what they're trying to accomplish with this alternative portfolio is extremely important. And then the risk step or determination on top of that is the biggest step. And what I mean by the biggest step is, is it's not only looking at what your net worth ratio is, what's a devaluation impact to that, are we comfortable with that? But then we gotta take those scenarios and educate the board to understand those risks as well. And then drilling even further down is, is educating on every type of product that would be used within that portfolio. Uh, understanding not only are we using common stocks, but now what are the risks to common stocks? What happens to, the, uh, to our investment if you know, something happens to the company, if they get merged into another company or they expand or they do splits? And all the, just understanding those risks are extremely important important needs to be documented, put in board meeting minutes. And so that way going into say an examination cycle, you can demonstrate, uh, we understand our risk. We have a financial partner that understands the risk and our board has approved something that they've been fully uh, made aware of all, everything that we're doing and they're okay with it. And then the documentation of that, which I kind of explained, is important to continue to do on an ongoing basis. And what I mean by that, as we go through economic cycles, and right now is a great time to talk about is, is sector rotation. We've had a lot of uh, devaluation in the marketplace under uh, tech, com tech companies. You know, Meta or Facebook, as most people know them as, is, you know, they're way down right now. So, but you think about that sector rotation and doing the shock and analysis to your portfolio and the impact to your net worth and income on an ongoing basis is critical in documenting that as well. But ultimately, you know, with thinking about corporate governance, the board of directors has is has the final say in everything, and they can empower Elko with, you know, doing a lot of the decision making as long as the board's been educated and understanding the risk and the risks that they are uh, delegating down to management on this. Yeah, it's really important to follow the process, and the board does have to approve. So 
very, very important, but I do agree with you more than anything here is that risk determination and determining what's right for you. And having that policy to put in place is, is really, really key. And so with that, you know, starting the process now is better than later. Um, you know, we can start making money throughout the year to pay for increased benefit expenses to start your new foundation or charitable activities. Um, really important. And, uh, you know, I think that, that we would want to start a conversation about what are the risks? How much stock limitation should we have? How much price change volatility? What's the correct size of the portfolio? What's your, what, what is your mission? What's your desire here? Um, with that, we take all that information, we develop a policy, and, and then we help you get that policy approved by the board of directors. You know, this is something that is approved by the regulators, state and federal. Um, it's accepted by them. It's, it's seen and it's normal. So with that, Craig, I really want to thank you for, for sharing your insights and thoughts on, on, on the EVPA and CDA portfolios. And this is a great way for financial success. Not often that for uh, you know, an activity where you can come up with how to make more money uh, than, than you are today and, and, and to pay for other expenses, even take on some employee retention or, or uh, you know, some sort of retirement plan for free. And so really, really exciting and, and that, that it's important to have that, those risks understood. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome, Charlie. And and just to drill the point ho- down, uh, point home is the size of your institution is not the determining factor of whether this makes sense for you or not. That does d- help drive into net worth and how much you can invest in. But this is a product that for everybody, as long as they have some other under uh, uh, characteristics of a, a decent capital ratio, or I should say adequately capitalized and some other things. But it's really the process that everybody needs to go through, regardless of size, it works for them. Yeah, it's, it's a very good point. It, it, any any size institution can participate in this. So I really appreciate you bringing up that point. Yeah, you bet. All right, so coming up, our next webinar is uh, a month away to the day, uh, March 9th at 2 to 3 p.m. And uh, we're running actually a series uh, that we obviously we're updating from last year, but this is a new series we did last year, ALM 101. Very highly attended, very uh, requested for again. So really excited to bring that. It'll be a basic uh, course, educational course, hour-long course on asset liability management. And uh, you should get an invite uh, in the email or through the bottom of our, our, our emails and, uh, and also at our website and our webinar section of our website. Uh, if not, please reach out to your advisor or Kaylee. She's happy to uh, get you a link there. Again, if you want to get to any of our, our webinars, you can go to our website and there you'll see the webinar section, which has the current webinar and historical webinars. Also, all of our historical webinars are on our YouTube page. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you, Craig, first of all, very much for spending an hour with me today. Yep, you're welcome. It's enjoyable. It was. And thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to seeing all of you uh, very soon. Have a safe and wonderful afternoon.